Thanks, Terry. And thanks, everyone, for coming today. Um, uh, have a couple of great uh, uh, talks to follow. I uh, hope uh, this will be interesting. This will be a little different in the sense that um, um, my name is Azam Khan. I'm from Autodesk Research in Toronto. And um, uh, the, the, I'm going to take some of the, uh, the ideas in the article a little further as we've, we've uh, gotten a little further since, since then. So hopefully uh, uh, it'll, uh, it'll draw uh, a vector of uh, where we would like to go with this work. I just wanted to start with just a, a thing that we usually skip over, uh, but uh, a bit of a, uh, some thoughts on, on sustainability and the, the origins of that are said to sometimes have come from this image where in the, when the first time the entire Earth was photographed uh, on the black background showing that it really is a closed system, a finite closed system. And uh, uh, we, we, that, that's all there is. And uh, we can transform it in different ways. I've been trying to develop this diagram for a couple of days, but uh, it's based on a, a diagram from a United Nations report on, um, on uh, resources. And the thing I'm trying to uh, move towards capturing in this diagram are these three spheres starting with the environmental sphere uh, uh, surrounding the economic sphere and in the center is the recovered resource sphere I'm calling it where um, the, the way things flow uh, trying to integrate some spiral aspect to this thing where uh, from the outside virgin resources come in and uh, uh, extracted into raw materials and energy, going into production, consumption, and waste. And each, at each stage, there's, uh, there's emissions, but there's also opportunity to recover products and byproducts from whatever it is and, uh, and bring things into the center. And so once they leave, these resources leave the, the natural environment and enter the economic sphere is something we, we build. Um, the idea is to bring it into that center sphere uh, and keep it there as long as possible. The longer something stays in, uh, and is useful and uh, usable, uh, the, the greater delay we put into before bringing in new virgin resources. And uh, the way to make something most sustainable is to make it last a long time. I was talking to um, a, a, a researcher who just recorded everything he did for a long time and, and uh, analyzed the effect of using all these different things. And uh, his, his, uh, his real insight from that whole project was that uh, whether you use something that's made out of this material or that material uh, is not as significant is as if it lasts a really long time. So that's, that's the really way to to uh, extend the sustainability of something. Uh, so buildings is a good case in that they do last for, or they can last for a long time, but that's also um, has the cost that if it's, if it's uh, uh, not efficient, that inefficiency also lasts for a long time and the cost becomes greater and greater. And so uh, in the big picture, when we're looking at the total, uh, uh, sustainability uh, concept globally, it is about balancing consumption and production and balancing not just uh, in the sense of, of having them uh, opposably be equal but feeding each other. Coincidentally, there's a United Nations branch on sustainable consumption and production uh, uh, run by the United Nations Environment Program. And they report what is the, what are the largest sustainability problems in the world, and of course, even thinking about that is is challenging, uh, and coming up with metrics to measure that is challenging, and so uh, they've they've uh, in the in the studying that come up with three dangers: uh, global warming potential, land use competition, and human toxicity, are the three. Uh, uh, bars on the left, and those to to help uh, 
integrate those as the, how they relate to each other in terms of an environmental uh, uh, damage, there's the environmentally weighted material consumption indicator on the, on the right column there. And uh, maybe as you can see, hopefully this is legible, uh, the number one, uh, well you can see in land use competition it's dominated by animal products. That is a, the largest land use competition problem, just so much land is being used directly and indirectly in that process that uh, it, it's, it's very bad. And that combined with the global warming potential leads to the final outcome at 34.5% of the environmental problem is that. Followed by crops and then coal. Coal you can see uh, at almost 15% there is being burned to, to make power. Uh, but if you look at the third column, if you combine it with its neighbors, natural gas and uh, crude oil, that those three together are quite significant as well. Um, sustainability, of course, covers every, every aspect, but uh, the most popular one we talk about is the atmospheric issues and carbon and carbon accounting and so on. And if we, if we just focus in on the environmental problems involving the, well, these are all linked, of course, none of them exist exist separate from each other. But if we just look at the atmosphere issue, um, we can see just in that uh, aspect is a very compli complex system, a uh, complex multi-scale system going from, you know, CO2 and uh, methane and nitrous oxide and so on, um, up to hurricanes and large natural disasters. You can see land use competition there, land use changes, deforestation, and then uh, clouds and, and the weather climate system. Uh, down here we have transport, heating, industry, agriculture for fossil fuel burning. And all of these affect each other too at these different scales. And I'll get to what we hope to do with this. Uh, again, just looking at the atmosphere, uh, the greenhouse gases, a lot of people forget that H2O is also a greenhouse gas. and uh, you know, even uh, no matter how you make energy, it typically involves taking hundreds of thousands of gallons and putting it into the air. Uh, then there's, of course, CO2, uh, methane, nitrous oxide, ozone, and CFCs. Probably everybody's too young here to know what happened with CFCs. Uh, does anybody know the CFC story of chlorine, atoms? No. Um, I should tell it because it's, it's worth Googling probably, hopefully it exists on Google, is that uh, CFCs uh, uh, were found to uh, be this uh, very, very damaging um, uh, molecule that uh, in 1987, the Montreal uh, uh, summit on materials that deplete the ozone layer was, was held. I, I'm, I'm mis misnaming it, but something like that. And um, in Montreal, they decided to ban CFCs globally. And the, the reason is that it was discovered that they were um, terribly damaging to the ozone layer, which is a thin layer at the top of the atmosphere, protecting us from uh, many things, including ultraviolet radiation. The problem is that when they were using CFCs and declared them safe, it was because at, at normal um, uh, levels around the, the, the Earth, they are somewhat safe let's say, but um, uh, they have an extremely long lifetime. So the lifetime of CFCs can be up to 1,700 years. And uh, so at that time scale, they can actually live quite well in the upper atmosphere. When they're struck by ultraviolet radiation, uh, one of the chlorine molecules can, or atoms can break off, take an ozone uh, molecule, take one of the atoms of oxygen, uh, resulting in O2 and ClO, and then another oxygen atom can pull that one off, uh, creating a new free chlorine atom, and by this way keep keep destroying ozone theoretically for for a long time. So even in 1987, it was believed that uh, whatever CFCs were in the atmosphere at the time would continue s destroying the ozone layer for at least 60 years. So the hope was by around 2050 that uh, the CFCs would, would uh, dissipate at that point somehow. And so, uh, you know, we're all familiar with the ozone hole pictures. I should have added the slides for this, but 
uh, the ozone holes uh, discovered over different parts of the northern and southern hemisphere are still happening because that, those CFCs are still destroying ozone. But again, uh, when we just focus on the atmosphere part of the, uh, the sustainability problem, buildings are the number one cause of greenhouse gases uh, indirectly from generating the energy to power these buildings. And this is why CMOS, uh, you know, correctly is hoping for non-mechanical solutions. Followed by the meat industry now becomes the number two uh, cause. And all of transport, typically when we tell people about sustainability, they think, well, I should ride my bike or I should stop, you know, I should take public transport, I shouldn't buy a car and this and that. But all of transport, cars, ships, planes, trains, everything together is only 14% of the greenhouse gas problem. So buildings is clearly, you know, more than the other two combined is uh, the signif significant problem. I always like to show this picture because um, uh, this is a, an, a, everybody familiar with this project? It's called the Green Lighthouse Project in Copenhagen at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, it's a really great building. It's not very large, but it has all of these nice properties. And uh, I like this, in particular, this diagram because it has all the components going on there that show complexity in a building, um, which causes, I think, uh, you know, the buildings being the number one environmental problem for the atmosphere, but um, it also so it shows potential solutions. Uh, it, has, uh, it has the sun, the moon, the earth, uh, ground storage, uh, uh, heat, heating and cooling, and little people are running around, and the airflow, stack effect, buoyancy, uh, solar cells, and, um, uh, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a picture drawn by an illustrator, probably using Adobe Illustrator, based on uh, an architect's design intent. And the question we have in my research group is we asked like, how can we generate the real-time version of this picture based on sensor data that actually knows where the people are and what the airflow is like and, and how effective the different systems are and actually have a tool that will help you in the design time while you're designing your building, giving you this kind of feedback in a simulation, but then uh, switching, the, the, the software should not know whether those sensor values are simulated sensor values or real sensor values. So when you switch to the real building, when it's complete, you will already be trained at looking at what the operation of your building looks like. So that's, the, that's one of the goals of, the, of my group. Uh, we started uh, working on this a couple of years ago, so this is called Project Dasher, and it's, it's like a dashboard for a building, and we're working towards creating that, that real-time version of that other picture. And so we have the timeline at the bottom, and then we have our building. This is actually our building in Toronto, so if anybody comes by Toronto, feel free to come by and visit us. Uh, uh, I'm on the, on the fifth floor there. It's actually an interesting case. It's a, kind of a best case, worst case building because it's actually four old buildings stuck together and um, uh, that creates a lot of uh, interesting issues for us. Anyway, there's one of the visualizations there which is the power usage in the building and the, because we know the total power consumption, uh, we can actually uh, report the submeter values that we added. We added some submeters to, to, to each floor, but because we know the total, we can also show the unmetered value, how much is unmetered there in the gray. And that is a, a hopefully part of a continuous improvement uh, mechanism to help you help whoever's running the building see that, oh, you know, I should add some more submeters because I still don't know where everything's going and get a better picture over time to improve things. So it's not necessarily about maybe creating the, the ultimate building uh, at one specific time, but creating a building that can actually get better over time. Uh, this is, you could say, is the current process uh, that we use of designing, simulating, uh, looking at the analysis of the simulation and then visualizing it and then feeding that back. But uh, uh, I, I, I'm, my, my goal is uh, to have simulation be a, uh, actually a, be a design tool. So instead of having simulation as something you run on your design, it is actually a design tool that you use in your design. And so it really has to collapse a lot of these elements into one thing. So um, 
just by having them broken into separate pieces creates all of the a lot of the problems that Simos was talking about earlier. And um, and uh, could maybe not coincidentally, I have some similar barriers that uh, Simos had for um, uh, current simulation problems. Uh, there's a uh, there's a good book uh, uh, on building simulation where. Um, the, one of the problems is that these simulations were a lot of them have a lot of historical problems in that uh, there's some great old Fortran code in there and this and that and and they they have certain limitations because they were written at a certain period in in history and uh, and they require this reduction of the model so that the simulator can understand it and unfortunately this dumbing down of the of the design so that the simulation software can handle it is really the the opposite of what you would like to do. How, and so I would propose that we should smarten up the simulation so that it can handle a real design and do the right thing, whatever that might be. And requiring an expert to control the simulation is also uh, a, a barrier that prevents this from becoming a design tool. And uh, so uh, being a simulation expert should also not be required to be able to use it. And then for understanding the results, that's also an interesting research problem. Uh, we can try to try to combine a couple of words into simulization of like visualizing simulation results so that you can actually use them uh, to support your decisions that you're making. And also in my fantasy simulation program, uh, it would be it would be something that uh, everybody. Uh, can be involved in. Like if we're really going to have sustainability, everybody needs to be involved, also the occupants. And, uh, and uh, on, the, on the creation of the simulation, uh, academia, government, and industry all need to be participating. Otherwise, we'll have, again, these broken things. So again, this is really about integration of bringing together all these different types of simulation uh, and also the different experts who, uh, who uh, can create them. And creating a collaborative simulation framework is, is a challenge, but that's the challenge that we're trying to address in the, the symposium that I started. Uh, the best way to predict the future is to invent it, so uh, that's uh, instead of waiting until, until a certain future comes about, I thought we'd get that process started by, uh, I created this uh, symposium on simulation for architecture and urban design together with uh, Ramta Natar and my group and uh, Reese Goldstein and others. And uh, so what we're trying to do with this, this, uh, this venue is create a research environment for the simulation research community to talk to the architecture research community. These are quite separate. In fact, I would claim that most people have never even met a simulation researcher. Simulation research of like what is simulation and what can you prove about it is a very interesting uh, uh, area that we can really benefit from uh, listening to these people and, and working with them to create this collaborative simulation framework that I'd like to see. Um, I just, we, together with Robert, we called it Design Devs. Uh, devs is discrete event uh, simulation and it's a, it's a uh, mathematical formalism for what simulation is. And the nice thing about that is there's been, been many uh, interesting uh, uh, proofs about what, what is possible there. Normally this would be the end of my presentation because this is the idea, what we want, where we want to go and what's going on, but we have gotten a little progress in the meantime. So I'll just show you a couple of slides, last couple of slides here where uh, in, a, in a little building, uh, a dev simulation is modular and hierarchical and composable so that it can support a bunch of different types of uh, simulation models like an occupant model, uh, weather model, indoor space, we have the little uh, occupant there opening the window affecting the envelope, but also can turn the thermostat, which is also a sensor which affects the heating and so on. And each one of those little nodes can be contributed from experts in those areas. And through creating uh, interfaces between those things that we can all accept and, and agree on, uh, we could have the weather system come from the weather people, the people that know what, what the climate modeling can be. And um, 
uh, other people can contribute their pieces, including people that design some of these materials or mechanical components that you might have a build in a building, including automatic blinds or rooftop units or whatever it is, but uh, in, a, in, a, in a way to support creating a simulation of something that can get better over time is, the, is my goal so that, um, so that you can take even existing buildings and, and apply this process, hopefully, to understanding how to make existing buildings better as well. Uh, currently, we just at Simod, we just had the first or the third um, annual Simod meeting a, a month ago or so, and we just showed the first version of this. So this is this is a research project. This is not a product or anything like that. And I'm I'm totally hoping we can work on it together as a as a community, and uh, we can uh, understand together how these things should work. It's a regular IDE. There's Lua as the scripting language currently. This is just an experiment. Hopefully, it'll work with any kind of language, especially new and more expressive languages. And uh, and uh, you can compose these components in from distributed sources or parallel. And so that that's uh, again some benefits of using devs. And I think that's about it. Oh no, we're not there yet. <laughs> uh, the 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 other part about um, uh, the future of simulation is I think it's. It's, we're going to have to go beyond, again, the first step of integration, which I mentioned earlier, is integrating the different types of simulation. So we can have this one framework that includes CFD, occupant simulation, all these different kinds of things, uh, thermal dynamics, uh, but then go beyond that with integrating that with the sensors. So in the military, they would call these cyber physical systems. But uh, uh, in research, we call them symbiotic, symbiotic simulations that that interact with the physical system so that you have this simulation uh, being part of the actual system that it's controlling or is participating in. So on the left, you can see a uh, symbiotic simulation control system, the acronym there, SSCS. And on the right is a, a symbiotic simulation decision support system. I think I got the acronyms right there and um, that involve an external decision maker. So that's, that's a human there using that. So imagine having a system like this to, uh, to uh, improve policy. So you would like feedback from the real world, from the physical system. That little data arrow going in is a bunch of sensors. Uh, and then using that to uh, attempt a bunch of simulations to help you understand what to do. And on the left could be a building control system even for a natural, naturally ventilated building. Uh, and the, the system could participate in continuous calibration of the simulation, making it smarter over time, helping inform what's really going on as the conditions change in the building. And uh, uh, here's a, just a little slide of, of what we've done in our building, uh, the 210 King building in Toronto, where we've created this building information model and we brought it into Dasher, and we put millions of these little sensors around. And if you go to 210king.org, 210king.org, uh, you can see all the there's all the files there as well. You can you can have a look, and uh, uh, a blog about the process we did to to learn more about our own building. And then hopefully we can collaboratively collaboratively generate much more advanced simulations that. They could look at <coughs> look at the whole thing. Thank you.